Okay. Very good. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Ann Carey Ford calling in from Ojai, California. Very happy to be hosting John McIntosh today in the Q&A, what's really going on with a bunch of question marks. Um, today's topic is shock and chaos. And um, you're welcome, absolutely welcome to leave a question in the comments as we go along. I'll try to get to them if time allows. And we're going to try to keep this broadcast, as usual, at 55 minutes long. So um, if you happen to be watching the replay, you can go to John's uh, channel, where all of the archive of the previous 10 Q&As are um, listed sequentially. There's the link right there. These links will also be in the, um, in the notes below. So um, let's see, if you're watching a replay, you can definitely email John your question if you have one, and we will try to get to it at a future broadcast. There's his email, globalpeaceweb at gmail.com. Wanted to mention that I have a website myself, voiceofdivinefeminine.com where I um, share my own insights. I just did some updates to that page, so please come and visit. And I'm sure most of you are very familiar with John McIntosh. Um, want to mention that some of his books are available at the link that he's popped up just now. Um, so you can check those out, highly recommend. And um, I'm going to skip John's bio because I think most people are very familiar with who he is. So without further ado, I'm going to invite him to say a few words before we get into the questions. John. Thank you uh, again, uh, Anne, for uh, being the uh, hostess of uh, our little Q&A every week and the fine uh, representation of the truth that uh, you are as my uh, partner here. Um, this week, um, I wanted to address um, obliquely what's going on uh, in the dream that I'm sure, unless you've been on vacation, uh, hidden away from the rest of the world, and if that's possible uh, today, uh, is uh, basically going crazy. And uh, uh, some places are more crazy than others. Um, and as scary as this might be, um, it's actually uh, the natural aspect of what goes on when there is a shift. As I mentioned, I have a, a book called The, the Great Shift Explained, um, which is uh, just a little handbook. It's about a 30-minute read. Um, so we're talking constantly, and it's actually part of the, the uh, subtitle, subtext of this um, series of Q&As is the, the shift. So I, I'd like to address something that I, I uh, touched on in the second um, broadcast that we did a few months ago, uh, which is awakening uh, and the three stages that it takes. Um, and this is going on at, at um, a greatly accelerated um, stage uh, right now, uh, beginning with the awakening that occurs when uh, the mass of humanity uh, begins to recognize that the dream that they're in, they don't know it's the dream, but the dream that they're in, the world they're in, the reality that they call reality that they're in um, is not what they thought it was, not what they have been told it was uh, from childhood, that there are many things going on, some shocking things that are going on um, and seem to be expanding. Uh, they're not really, they're just being exposed. Uh, they've always been there. Uh, but that are going on that are very, very upsetting. Now, I don't talk about the story because the story's not real. Uh, and the more that, that your attention, meaning anyone, your attention is focused on the story, that is the moment-to-moment -moment experience of the dream that's going on, the dream called this world, this universe, your life that's going on, the more you focus on that, the more real it is. Um, and, and so I don't talk about the actual circumstances, I sort of dance around it a little bit. But the one thing that I have talked about, and I'll mention again with regard to this first phase of awakening, 
that's going on in a more dramatic and shocking way for for anyone that, that um, still perhaps has not um, uh, made the deep dive uh, into the search for truth, so-called search for truth, um, is um, is the uh, cycle where a, a phase, in this case the divine masculine that's been going on for about 11,000 years, has ended. Um, and it doesn't end sort of like abruptly on a Tuesday. It, it, it takes a few years before it phases out or the house of cards collapses. This is what's going on. We've been in it now for about eight years. And uh, it's where the divine feminine doesn't overtake or destroy or anything like that. It balances with the divine masculine uh, into a a sensibly neutral phase. Later on, after the neutral phase ends, the divine feminine becomes the predominant uh, frequency that's occurring for another 11,000 years. This is all a dream as well. The cycle of 11,000 years plus a couple of thousand of neutral plus 11,000 plus two. So about 26,000 year cycle, it's a dream. It's a dream within a dream within a dream. And it happens to be our solar system's uh, dream, our sun connected with a number of other suns within the, the dream of the universe. Um, these phases go on. And this has happened over and over and over again throughout clock time since the beginning, so-called beginning of the dream universe. So during the, the, the final stages of it, which basically is what's happening as we, we expand into the age of light, this neutral phase, as I call it, the age of light or neutral phase, um, the, the drama uh, expands. Um, uh, it's like watching an action movie where the sound goes up and there's uh, shooting and there's car races and there's fighting and there's yelling and screaming and all kinds of nonsense is going on. Uh, this is exactly what's happening in the world now. And you can see this uh, in regard to um, the restrictions that um, have uh, uh, those that, had the the influence or so-called power um, in the dysfunctional divine masculine, which is always dysfunctional at the end of a phase, um, seem to have over humanity in a clandestine way, where they they weren't known to be controlling uh, the the drama, uh, where they sort of come out from their hiding spot and and expose what their agenda is. The agenda has already. Uh, you could say failed um, and um, is collapsing, uh, but there's still a last gasp attempt to uh, maintain control over the uh, narrative, uh, the story, the drama, uh, the dream. And that's what's happening right now. And that last gasp um, shows up in this case in the drama called um, a, a pandemic. Uh, it's it's completely false, not real at all, which has been exposed in literally in the last few days by the the um, CDC that basically admitted that they were lying, and this is the way it it um, it comes out, uh, or the efficacy of masks, for example, which are actually extremely dangerous because of the increased carbon dioxide that almost ten to twenty times higher than your you're normally taking in can be damaging to the brain. Um, the social distancing, which is all about keeping people apart. All of these things are orchestrated as part of the last ditch attempt to control society. And then, and then you add in the violence and the riots and all of this, which is also planned, orchestrated, nothing to do with spontaneity. It's all planned by the, what many people are calling the deep state. This is all part of a drama a story, not real. It's a dream. Um, and so there's there's no um, there's no judgment um, on my part uh, as the self uh, as to whether this is good or bad. The self never involves itself in the story. Uh, it observes it, of course, uh, if it's in a body uh, in the world, but not of the world. But it never it never makes a judgment because it knows that all it's doing is looking at itself in disguise. Some of those disguises are disgusting. Some of them are exquisitely beautiful. But they're all the self. Everything is the self. There is no such thing as humanity. There's no such thing as a world, a planet, um, uh, your life experience, a universe. None of these things are real. To the vast majority of humanity, 
they're extremely real. They're the only reality. And to speak like I'm speaking right now is, is beyond insane to most of humanity. Uh, but there are some uh, that are in this first phase waking up to the fact that the world that they thought was real is not the way it really is. It's still the world to them. It's still a story, a narrative, not a dream, but real to them. And it's not the way they thought it was. In fact, it's, it's very scary. Now, what's happening here uh, is in this phase is what you might call a deprogramming. The body-mind identity um, that we call a person is made up of produced from, projected from conditioning. Attachments, expectations, and identifications tied to memory and imagination. I've spoken about this and will many times. That's what makes up this body-mind identity that we call a person um, or what people call this is me. And it is an amalgam of lies. None of it's true um, because you are the self. You are perfect. You are pure. You are unchanging. And the way that the life experience moment to moment plays out for most of humanity is always changing and always a roller coaster of happiness and sorrow. So this has taken eons to fall into from the initial belief in the idea of, first of all, by the self, and then the belief in separation, which then led to the world of opposites, which allows the creation of the universe. And so it took eons. It didn't take any seven days. It took eons to come to this hypnosis that in our little case, humanity, so-called, has come to believe is real. So to deprogram this also takes a little while. It doesn't take eons of clock time. Uh, it takes very, very little time, but it does take some shocking events, shocking drama, shocking Shake up, I like to call it shaking a rag doll, to recognize that it's not real. And it begins with the shake up of what you thought was real within the dream, still believing it's a dream, uh, to the point where you recognize that this isn't the way it really is. And this allows you to open up, it's kind of a shattering effect uh, of the rigidity of, the, of the, the, the frozenness of the sleeping beauty to begin the, the, I'll call it a process, it's not really, but a process of awakening to something deeper. And this takes some, in this case, because we're making this, this major uh, phase from the dysfunctional divine masculine into the neutral phase, this takes quite a few people, so-called people, into the next phase, which is the recognition that this is a dream. Now, this recognition is mental. Uh, it's not a knowingness, which, which you could say is in the heart or a feeling. Uh, you're still on the stage, in the movie, playing your part, but you know that this is a dream. You know it mentally, or you believe at least that it's a dream. You have not yet come to the phase where you are completely aware that it's not real. You just simply believe, oh, uh, this is a dream, uh, and I'm just uh, walking around in a dream. I'm playing in a dream. There can be a phase where you feel like nothing matters, and there, there's a, a trap that, that can happen to a lot of uh, individuals there. I'm not going to give a name to the belief systems, only that uh, there can be a kind of an apathetic or blasé or cavalier uh, attitude towards nothing mattering. But that's not true because uh, there's still a lot of suffering going on and um, the the uh, expression of, of compassion to that suffering um, disappears uh, when you become blasé to it. Um, so uh, I never talk about that. Uh, only that uh, just because you recognize it's a dream doesn't mean that you shouldn't exercise compassion and caring and love to the extent that you understand what love is. So that's the second phase, and many are now moving from this total hypnosis to the awareness that the dream isn't what I thought, uh, to the, or, or the world, the reality is not what I thought, to the second phase, which is the awareness 
at the mental level that it is a, a, uh, a dream to the next phase where there is a deep commitment to um, awakening completely from the dream, which is what I call the no matter what choice to be free. And, and many more than has been the case for thousands of years are moving from that middle phase, that middle awakening phase, as a result of the drama um, that's, that's going on, uh, making life far more difficult. But then, of course, this also uh, is, is part of the opening, once again, process of leaving the dream and shifting into a choice to be free for real. And freedom for real is self-realization, the recognition that you are the self. You are God. You are consciousness. You are the screen on which the drama or the movie is taking place. Uh, you are not the movie. You are the screen. You're the blank screen that doesn't change, uh, that uh, the, the drama has been taking place that you thought was real. You were part of the dream at one point. You were part of the, <clears throat> the story at one point. <coughs> but now you recognize this is not you. I'm the screen. And, and you shift your attention toward the screen uh, and away from the drama. That's what's happening. So to get back to the reason that I'm explaining all of this at the beginning of this particular broadcast at, at length is that the circumstances that are unfolding right now, uh, although they may seem dramatic, if, for example, you, and when I say you, I mean humanity, most of sleeping humanity, all of a sudden was exposed to all of the subterfuge that's been going on, the camouflage, the hypnosis that's been going on, some really, really nasty stuff in terms of the story, which is a dream. Remember, it's a dream. It's not really happening, uh, but it can be really, really nasty. Uh, many, many minds would snap. Now, we talk about losing the mind. Well, losing the mind is something that must be done in order for the self to be recognized. But if it snaps and it's not a, a gradual um, extrapolation out of the dream, uh, then the mind can snap and it's like a shutdown. So what the self does, and I'm, I'm not trying to tell you that there's a formula here, but what happens is there is a gradual segue it's not that gradual. It's very, very quick in clock time, um, what's occurring right now. But it's gradual in terms of, of the segue from complete hypnosis to the awareness that, that something is wrong with this picture. That's in the first phase of awakening. And then for those that are ready to shift into the awareness that it's a dream, and then for those that are ready to shift into the choice to be free. So this is what's happening. It's gradual, although it looks very fast. It's very, very chaotic as a result of the shockingness of what's going on. But it's all part of this shift of awareness, of conscious awareness from complete oblivious hypnosis, which is most of humanity, to, uh, and you can see this by the, the robotic way that people are obeying laws uh, that are just made up to a pander to uh, a story, which is not true. Um, you know, the, the pandemic, for example, which is, is not real at all. Um, none, of, none of what's going on right now is real. So when, when this shift occurs gradually, once again, it's pretty fast, but it's gradual enough that the mind doesn't snap um, for billions of people uh, and allows for a segue uh, into a, an expanded awareness that then allows for the possibility of focusing completely on total freedom, which is what I'm here for, what Anna's here for. So that's kind of a long-winded explanation of what's going on, but I think it's very important because things are heating up. Um, it's extremely good thing, as difficult as it, as, it, as it is for many people, but that difficulty is what what brings you to a level of frustration where you make a choice to to look deeper, and the only way to do that is to go within. So I'll leave it at that. All right. Well, I'm going to start the questioning with uh, one of the questions from Hestel, who's on the live feed today. She would like to know, so many are using the word transfiguration when I personally think it's only transformation. 
Please explain your take on transfiguration. Once transfigured, does your body changes appearance? Does your body change appearance and stay that way? Okay. Well, let's first of all uh, talk about the, the word uh, take, um, and this is not being picky, and it's certainly not being uh, critical or arbitrary. Um, the self which is who's talking to you right now. John McIntosh was here, and there's still a body that looks like it, but this is the self that's speaking to you. Um, this is not a big thing. You're the self too. I'm just simply aware of it all the clock time. Uh, you're the same as me, no different at all. It's just awareness. That's all it is. Um, so the self has no take. It has no opinion. It has no perspective. It's empty. It's nothing. But when it uh, arises at a, arrives at a, at a juncture where there is a so-called quote unquote need for an answer, let's say to something, then it knows there's no gray area. It's, it's not a, a possibility. It's not a, a take. It's, it's simply talking about what really is. So, uh, and I mention this frequently because many people still talk to me as if I'm a person, which I'm not, and neither are you, none of you, but, the difference is it waffles back and forth. The conscious awareness waffles back and forth between I'm a person, I'm the self, I'm a person, I'm the self. Oh, gee, it's very difficult to believe that I'm really this. Uh, but uh, ultimately, eventually, what happens is you're, you recognize I am the self. And it's not a big deal. It's a very big deal. But it's not a big deal. So you're not special. Okay, so from the standpoint of these words, uh, transfiguration you could say is is uh, very much oriented to Christianity uh, and the the idea of the body changing into let's say a body of light. Um, uh, it's a very popular terminology. Uh, transformation can mean uh, uh, shifting from one thing to another. Uh, so you could say that these two words are interchangeable insofar as as um, uh, something let's call it the body looking this way when it's sleeping and looking that way when it's awakened, when it's, if you're talking Christianity, the Christ consciousness or uh, a Buddha consciousness or Krishna consciousness, uh, whatever way you want to look at it, um, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, you're still talking about a body. The body doesn't exist. The body is a dream. So the transformation of a body from something to something, even if that occurs, and certainly if you're looking into the eyes, let's say, or even the face of a, uh, of a being that is fully self-realized and still uh, the, uh, the self uh, is aware of itself, is in a body, uh, there is no question you, you're going to feel at some level, at the level of your ability to feel truth, you're going to feel something uh, exquisitely beautiful. Um, is that a transfiguration or transformation? Absolutely. But it's still a dream. It's not real. What happens is the, uh, and I speak more particularly about the transformation of conditioning. Some people call it karma. I've said many times, I don't use the word karma because there's so many connotations associated with the word. Conditioning, attachments, expectations, and, and identifications um, dissolve. You could call it transform, but the transform not from something to something, it transforms back into nothing. So when the veil or the clouds that hide the self transform back into nothing or dissolve back into nothingness, and there's really no back into because they never existed anyway, but let's say that, that there's conditioning and then there isn't. Uh, there's clouds and then there isn't. Uh, then the sun or the self that you are and have always been and has never been missing, always is, never changing, becomes aware of itself. The self becomes aware, again, of itself because the conditioning, uh, you call it whatever you want, but that's what it is. That's what makes up the false self or the so-called human being or the personality, <clears throat> the person, uh, it's gone. It dies. It doesn't get better. Uh, it doesn't grow into something. It disappears. The self that you thought you were, small self, me, uh, body, mind, identity, disappears, dies, die before you die, 
uh, and the self that you are just simply is all that is there in your awareness. That doesn't mean to say that you don't still see the dream if you've chosen, if the self in that particular uh, moment uh, decides to stay in that particular body for some reason. I'm still here. I don't need to be here, but I'm still here for some reason. So um, transfer figuration, transformation, both don't really cover it. It's the desolation of the false self so that the self can be revealed. And it doesn't matter if the body shows up as some bright light. That's a specialness. That's phenomena. The mind loves that. And it likes to focus on that kind of thing because it makes it special. And that keeps you dreaming. It disappears. That's what really happens. And the real you, the self, capital letters, shows up. Hmm. I just decided to read Histel's second question. Um, she wants to know also, my feeling is that the spiritual teachers who taught all kinds of courses, tools, and ways to ascend in the past are becoming obsolete unless they can change into gently guiding people into self-realization, letting go of all the teaching, teaching courses, tools, and preaching, et cetera, instead of sharing only truth. Uh, this is a very astute uh, observation, um, and it's absolutely true, uh, but it's not a critical judgment of uh, the teachers leading up to this moment. It's just simply what was, you could say, quote unquote, necessary to address the level of awareness that most of humanity has had for thousands of years. And when one is focused intently on the dream as its reality, then the ways and means that are used to communicate with that hypnosis very often are tied to practices and disciplines that are long and arduous. Um, and this can be years of so-called practice um, uh, to still the mind. And what it's really doing is it's bringing the mind to one pointedness. That's what virtually all practices and disciplines are designed to do is to bring it to one pointedness. You can be meditating uh, for decades. You can move into samadhi for decades, off and on for decades. But the point is when you leave the meditation, when you leave samadhi, you're still back in the dream. You might be aware that it's a dream, but you're still back in it. Self-inquiry surrender is where all practices ultimately dovetail to end because what happens with self-inquiry is you're shining light on what is not real and it recedes back into the self and, dis and disappears, dissolves. And that's the only way that the self is, is permanently recognized as itself. But Anything that leads to and has led to for thousands of years to a one-pointedness or a one-pointed focus makes it easier for this focus on self-inquiry uh, to take place. And so all of these things have been wonderful stepping stones, and they're absolutely fine to continue if that's what you resonate with. Always the, the, the monitor for knowing is, is it joyful. And if it's joyful, then you're in the right place at this at this particular moment. Um, if it's starting to feel like mm, I might be done with this or it's not so joyful anymore, then it may be, probably is, uh, time for you to open up to the possibility of something else, which quite possibly might be self-inquiry sur or surrender or ideally both. So, yes, uh, to your question, it, 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 it is time for simplicity and clarity to uh, take first place. But if the more complicated ways and means of teachers for the last few thousand years feels joyful, then that's where you are. It doesn't make you less than, it's just that's where you belong in the moment. So both are fine, uh, but simplicity and clarity uh, most definitely is easier, much easier uh, to make the shift uh, from hypnosis from dreaming into full awareness of who you are. 
The next question is from Anonymous, um, who would like to know several people whom I listen to or read their posts continually refer to their guides and the guidance they receive. I ask the self if what I'm reading or hearing is right for me since guidance comes in many forms. My question is, is this guidance necessary and where is it coming from since we're all one and one collective consciousness? Hmm. Uh, this is probably a question that many people are questioning themselves with um, or possibly talking to others about, uh, wondering, you know, uh, this person that's channeling some galactic being or, or some entity from another star system or, or some uh, bizarre name uh, of some entity that's uh, coming through with some different voice or, or, uh, or just a, a little guidance that you're getting from within. Um, they're wondering, this is real. Well, let's get back to what is real. And keep in mind, I never, ever try to explain what the truth is because you cannot put a frame around infinity. You can only point to who you are not. Um, however, uh, one thing that can be spoken of without explaining it is there is only the self. Call it God if you want. Call it consciousness. Call it I am. Uh, the self in capital letters is all there is. You could call it one. Uh, one without any boundaries. Uh, so... If you are listening to someone, you can swear this is Jesus that's talking to me. This is Buddha that's talking to me, or this is this is uh, some uh, bizarre name, you know, from from uh, Egypt or 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 from uh, Atlantis or Lemuria or or some star system that's talking to me. I hear it loud and clear. Uh, it has to be real. If you are hearing this, and ideally. Uh, the guidance that you're receiving is conducive to your freedom. And you'll always know this by filtering you through the monitor of joy. If it feels joyful, then for you in the moment, it is for real for you. It's perfect in the moment. Five minutes from now, five years from now, it might not be. But right now, it's ideal for you because you feel joy. Then you're listening to the self in disguise. Because it resonates for you in the moment to hear it through um, an intermediary. And uh, you could even say that religion for many years was an intermediary between God and uh, the parishioner, uh, the devotee. Does that make it good or bad? No, it's just the way that the individual dreamer at that moment felt most comfortable communicating with something that it thought was greater than itself outside itself. So it was okay until it's not okay, until you feel like there must be more. This doesn't feel right anymore. I don't feel the joy of uh, this process any longer. Nothing wrong with the process. It's just you're done with it. So it's like a stepping stone. In some cases, you have to actually go to someone who is receiving this information. So that's twice removed. Now there's you, there's this person, they're channeling some other entity and it's communicating directly with the self, God or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, many, many stepping stones between you and God. None of them are true. You are God. And uh, there are no stepping stones. But if you feel comfortable, joyful, hearing guidance in that way. And if the guidance feels, again, joyful, then in that moment, only that moment, it's perfect until it isn't perfect. And then you stay open and another way will come. So there's, there's no judgment at all about these things. This is just one of the many ways of bringing the sleeping hypnotized dreamer back to the awareness of the self that it is. There's no wrong way. There's no right way. Ideally fast, but if it's not, that's okay because you have eternity to be free.
The next question is from Nirvana, who wants to know, I am following your blog and the Q&A sessions, which is really helping me. I understand that we're in dream and that there's no control of it by the false self, but I fail to implement this understanding all the time. Sometimes I am able to, but sometimes the false self takes over and I feel bad because I missed an opportunity. Is this what you mean by, what you keep mentioning that, let me just try that again. Is this what you keep mentioning? that when you choose freedom, no matter what, you're standing in the fire of who you are not? Uh, absolutely. Um, but let's just talk about, I feel bad that I've missed an opportunity. It's not possible for you to miss an opportunity because your life is predestined. Every moment, every breath you take, every glance this way or that way that you take, everything is predestined, not even the tiniest thing occurs as a result of this nonsense called free will. Within the dream, there is a dream called free will. Uh, and it seems like you have it, but you don't. Uh, your conditioning is what determines what is going to happen in the story, the narrative, the play, the movie that you're acting in as a body-mind identity, as a personality, as a personal self, as personal false self, personal individual it's all predetermined the inspirations that you get to do something and then that you may actually do that may take you know the rest of your life all of it is predestined every microsecond of it is predestined based on previous conditioning until you make the no matter what choice to be free then instead of the and i've said this many times the zigzag program or or direction that you're taking to get home back to the awareness of the self becomes like the crow flies uh, direct and so then the the predestination which is always only one destination and that is to remember who you are the self um, the only purpose that anyone has here until it happens is to remember the self uh, it, it then becomes a straight line now when it becomes a straight mind line then that what that means is that the conditioning that has created the predestiny and the false self comes up very quickly. So instead of like a, using a pea shooter, it's like a machine gun. Um, bang, 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 bang. You're triggered all over the place. And there are many moments when you will face a particular trigger. Let's say, uh, let's say you have a, a predilection, uh, predilection to uh, becoming uh, easily agitated and angry. Uh, and this has been with you all your life. Doesn't matter what the reason is. And there's no good guy or bad guy. There's there's no judgment at all. It's just part of the conditioning. Um, and it's coming up. It's coming up. It's coming up. Being triggered, triggered, triggered. And you're and you're falling back into it again and again and again. And you feel bad that I'm not getting it right. Um, well, that's not the idea. When you move into self inquiry. The trigger is meant to make you in that moment aware of, we'll just use this same example, of this conditioning called anger. Many, many different faces it can wear, but just say anger. And you have the opportunity then to not be angry, to suppress the anger, to control the anger. That's not what you're trying to do. That, that, there's all kinds of therapies for that. Uh, and, uh, and some of them may appear to work, but the conditioning that caused the anger is what needs to die, dissolve, fade away. And the way to deal with that is self-inquiry. Who is it that is feeling angry? Me. Who am I? That's it. And that shines a light on, not on the anger, it shines a light on that layer of conditioning, and there are probably many if you're angry a lot, that layer of conditioning related to that manifestation of that conditioning, which in this case is anger. And how you respond outwardly in the dream, being, you know, flustered, being angry, being maybe in a rage, whatever it is, that has nothing to do with the efficacy the value of self-inquiry. 
what's happened is that layer of conditioning, once again, that caused the anger, this particular being very specific, uh, this particular manifestation, the, the condition, that layer has been dissolved because the light shone on it and it receded back into the self. This might take many, many, many uh, triggers and many, many, many uh, burning away of those layers before the anger goes. So uh, there's no need to focus on whether you did a good job or not. If you practiced, and I hesitate to use the word practice, but we'll use it in this case. If you practice self-inquiry and you asked who is it that's feeling, in this case, angry, me, who am I? Then you have burned away, and it's not you, it's grace, which is love in action. Of course, that's just the self, which is you, but you're not aware of doing it. Um, you have burned away a layer of conditioning. So there's no failure, no possibility of failure, none. What appearances, what appears in the dream is totally irrelevant. What's actually so-called happening is that the conditioning that causes has caused the anger, perhaps for many lifetimes, also dreams, uh, is burning away. So don't beat yourself up. You can't do anything wrong. It's not a possibility to do anything wrong. Hmm. Um, a question just popped up in the comments uh, from Akayet. Please forgive me if I've mispronounced your name. Who wants to know if everything is predestined, then does it really matter what choices are made? There are no wrong choices. <laughs> well, that's just what I said, isn't it? Uh, you can't make any wrong choices, not a possibility. You know, the worst possible thing that you can imagine as a so-called choice, and you're not really choosing, you think you're choosing, but you're not. Uh, it was your destiny to make that choice. The worst possible choice in some way is leading towards home. Now, uh, let me get back to what I said before. Most destinies are what I'd call a zigzag, um, uh, uh, pathless path home because there's so much conditioning involved. But when you make this choice, it has to be humble. It has to be sincere. It has to be totally transparent. You make this choice to be free, and then you add no matter what, which means you're willing to die. And then, of course, you, you, the personal self, does die. I'm not talking about the body. But you're willing. Anything, whatever it takes, no matter what is asked of me, I will so-called do it. Uh, when you've made the no matter what choice, then you could say something clicks in that changes the ball game, and it it immediately uh, gets rid of the zigzag approach home and takes you in a straight line. So uh, don't be concerned about the choices. If you feel absolutely passionate about making a choice to do X, Y, Z, whatever it is, and everybody says you're crazy, uh, or everybody says, uh, of course, that's exactly what you should do, or, or nobody says anything and you just feel good about it. doesn't matter what the choice is. There is only one choice that you make that means anything, and that is the no matter what choice to be free. That's the only choice, and then everything changes after that. But you can't fake that. You can't just say, oh, well, I choose to do that, because no matter what means no matter what. You know, just think about that for a second. What does that mean? <laughs> you can't hold back anything. No matter what means everything. So you can't force yourself to do that. It'll come when it comes. For me, it was January 5th, 1999. There was no other way for me. I had to jump off the cliff, and I did. And 15 years later, uh, I died, basically, and the self was there. Um, it was always there. That's it. Simple as that. Instead of 15,000 years or 1,500 lifetimes, it was 15 years, which is a blink. Uh, when you make that choice, everything changes. But all the choices before, it doesn't make any difference. None at all. No matter what the drama or the narrative or the story plays out as that may look incredibly stupid or bad or awful or, or, or the wrong thing or, oh, my God, I screwed up or I did the best thing possible. I, you know, I'm the hero of the planet. <laughs> None of it's real. 
you can believe it's real if you want to. That's how, that's absolutely okay. You can knock yourself out. Do that as many lifetimes as you want. But it's not real. Only, only the self is real. And the rest is not. But it doesn't matter <laughs> when you get that. You get it when you get it. You can't make a mistake. This next question is from Jenny, who's on our live stream today. Uh, she wants to know, I have a question about self-inquiry. I've been questioning every single thought that comes up in a day and asking, who is it? Does one compile a list of all thoughts and beliefs that they can think of and then ask, who is it? I feel a little stuck. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, you, you certainly could do that, but no. No, when something comes up, you're 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 walking in the park. You're headed to the grocery store. You're putting out the garbage. You're doing the dishes. Uh, you're making the bed. Uh, you know, most most of life is pretty mundane, um, and you're triggered by something. It can be a thought of something that happened yesterday, or it can be uh, the TV in the background uh, is, is that you can hear is saying something, and uh, it, it's triggering you. Um, and, uh, and you feel like, uh, oh, I need to do self-inquiry. Usually you don't say that to yourself, but you say, well, uh, who is it that is triggered by, is upset by, is triggered by uh, what I just heard on the TV? The answer is always me. Uh, and um, uh, who am I? That's it. If this happens a hundred times in the day, which very often it does happen a hundred times in a day when you're truly, truly following self-inquiry, maybe more than 100 times a day, um, then you deal with it. I mean, ideally, if you can deal with it, you may not be able to. There might be something, you know, very uh, so-called important in the dream that you need to attend to in the moment. But if you so-called remember that trigger later, as you probably will, uh, it didn't come up by accident. It came up because you were supposed to look at it. Um, you were ready to look at that particular layer of conditioning, uh, then that's when you deal with it. But in most cases, you're able to, it takes, you know, three seconds. You know, who is it that's disturbed by or triggered by X, Y, Z? Me, who am I? That's three seconds, less. Um, don't uh, feel that you need to make a list. Uh, that, that, that's planning. That's an agenda. Uh, that's control. And it's uncomfortable. And it's work. This is not work. It's attention, for sure. You're giving it attention. You can call it work, but it's not really work. You'll find it's very, very easy after a while. And it, it'll just come again and again and again and again. And that's the way self-inquiry works. And then one day, the conditioning is gone sufficiently that, that you hardly even recognize uh, this person anymore. And you, 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 uh, you are aware of the self that you are most of the clock time until it's the only thing you're aware of. Um, so no lists, no, no planning, no putting off. Ideally, no putting off. There's another question from Jenny. Um, I was wondering if my own brother, we're, so, we're both so-called adopted from different sources, could be a twin flame. I am currently not speaking to him as he aggravates me, hurts me, diminishes me so... I have chosen, quote unquote, no communication until I get to a stronger spiritual place. He most certainly triggers me. It doesn't seem worthwhile at this time to continue to expose myself to this triggering, but to inquire who is it that's triggered until it's burned away. Okay, let's just talk about twin flames for a second for those of you that haven't heard my answer uh, in regard to twin flames um, or looked at any of the other videos uh, where we've talked about it. Uh, there is no such thing as a twin flame. There is only the self. However, in the dream, uh, you can have all kinds of soulmates, and you most definitely can have a twin flame. Uh, but remember, it's a dream. It's not real. Um, I, myself, had what I thought were two twin flames in the latter years of this 15 years where I was standing in the, in the fire of who I'm not before um, freedom uh, finally arose. Um, were they twin flames? No, of course not, because there is only the self. But the illusion, the drama, the narrative of a twin flame did seem to exist. So it's it's real in a dream, but it's not real. 
uh, in truth. So let's just look at the brother. Uh, is it possible in the dream that the brother is a dream twin flame, a, a twin flame? Absolutely not. Um, a twin flame, when they show up in the narrative, in the dream, does not show up in an abusive way. They'll most definitely show up in a way that triggers you. Uh, this is not about uh, passionate sex, which a lot of people uh, allude to uh, when they're talking about uh, uh, twin flames, you know, uh, sublime, blissful, nonstop sex. This is nonsense. Uh, the relationship, so-called relationship with a so-called twin flame in the dream um, is usually a beautiful resonance with another being that is on the same page. I call it a very or totally clear mirror of who you are not. Uh, they may agree on many, many points with regard to so-called spirituality. Uh, and this, this is why in your destiny, you were brought to that uh, person. They were brought to you. It's not attracted. Uh, that, the law of attraction is also a dream within the dream. Uh, and it's, a, you know, what you put out, you get back absolutely true in the dream. In reality, no, because there's no distance in truth. Time and space is not real. There's no from here to there. But in the dream, it's very real. So uh, if someone comes in your life that, that you'd like to call a twin flame, there will be a harmonic resonance with that being that is beautiful. However, because the mirror is clear and because you in all likelihood have made the no matter what choice or you're very close to it, um, it's going to be fiery because you're constantly looking at who you are not. Uh, this doesn't mean that the person is a bad person that has all these terrible attributes that's showing them to you. No, they're just a reflector of who you're not. They don't necessarily have any of the conditioning you've got. Uh, but in some way, you're able to see who you're not by being with that individual that you resonate with. It's a clear mirror. You're literally looking at a mirror that is speaking to you about who you're not in whatever way. And there are many ways. So that excludes abusive relationships, someone that is possibly being physically abusive, but certainly emotionally, mentally abusive uh, with you. This is not the dream twin flame that I'm talking about. That's not going to happen. And, and never should anyone stay in an abusive relationship. Now, looking at predestiny, as we talked about earlier, since we mentioned it, um, is it your destiny? Could it be your destiny to be in an abusive relationship and, and try to so-called fix this person, as many people very often do, or they feel responsible for them, or they feel like they deserve to be with them? Whatever the reason is that they stay in an abusive relationship, that's also part of your destiny. But should you stay in an abusive relationship? Absolutely not. Um, nevertheless, you may end up staying in it because it's part of your destiny. So uh, that's a whole different subject that I won't get into uh, with regard to this question. We can talk about that another time. Uh, but this is definitely not a, a, a twin flame situation, and, and nor should you stay in. And you've obviously made that decision. You feel that you've made that decision already. I'm going to squeeze in one last question that just popped up in the comments from Sophie. Her question is, um, the no matter what choice, is it predestined? Is our destiny manufactured to bring us to this choice? Uh, that, that's an extremely good question. Um, is the no matter what choice predestined? Well, is freedom predestined? Is the full and total awareness of the self that you are, the self becoming totally aware of itself, unbroken seamlessly, uh, well, of course, uh, there was never any question about the self uh, remembering, if you like, who it is. Uh, was the no matter what choice predestined in a given lifetime? No, no, your, your, your destiny, is always part of your conditioning and your conditioning brings you to a point a demarcation point uh again and again and again of frustration where you've had enough 
uh, but and, and you you make the choice to be free, but it's not no matter what because then something comes up and you say, oh no no, I got to hold this back. God can handle everything. The self can handle everything. Take over everything except for this one thing or these three things. Um, I'll take care of that. This is too important to me. I can't let this go. This happens, and this is the waffling back and forth uh, that uh, the what I call the slumbering God self. That which that's the I call it the sleeping beauty. Um, you could say is yawning awake, but that yawning awake might take lifetimes. Remember, lifetimes reincarnation is also a dream, um, so it's not really happening, but it seems to be. Uh, so uh, no, the, no matter what choice in a given lifetime is not predestined. Um, it'll take place when you've had enough, and uh, when you've had enough, uh, happens when it happens. It's the only choice you have. The only choice that you have is is to make that choice. Wow. Photo finish. We're at 55 minutes. Um, well done. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for being a part of the, of the Q&A today. We will be here next week. Uh, same time, same station. Uh, probably. As as know, yeah. Probably. <laughs> Who knows? One, one never knows. Yeah. <laughs> never knows. Yeah. Um, but in, in the meantime, if you're if you're watching this as a replay, please don't forget that you can email John at globalpeaceweb at gmail.com. And um, any comments or suggestions that you have are also welcome. So um, thank you. Thanks thank for you for there. being with us, and thank you so much again, Anne, for being the hostess of the show. Yeah. Lots of love. God bless. Bye.